Welcome to the Endless Knot Podcast. Where the more we know, the more we want to find out. Tracing serendipitous connections through our lives and across disciplines. Hi, I'm Avon. And I'm Mark. And today we're talking about the history of the English language. Which is often a topic <laughs> here, but in particular today, since we are talking with Kevin Stroud of the History of English podcast. We know that this episode is coming out not long after the previous one, given our usual timing over the last six to eight months. This is a astoundingly short turnaround, but that's because this is another interview that we did while at the Sound Education Podcasting Conference. So we did it really on the same, no, the day before, I think we talked to Ryan from the last episode. And so we wanted to get it out soon mm -hmm. and we wanted to share it with you because it was a wonderful conversation with Kevin that we wanted to get out as soon as possible. We talk about his podcast, his interest in language and where it comes from. And of course, though we say it in the interview, if you are not already listening to the podcast, do. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, the history of the English language, starting from, as we'll, you'll hear, long before there was an English, <laughs> uh, currently in Middle English, and going to be working forward towards modern English. So without further ado, we'll present you the conversation. After this, we will be returning to more regular programming, but there may well be more interviews coming up, but it'll probably be a few more weeks before our next episode comes out. Enjoy. So welcome, Kevin. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for having me here. <laughs> How's the conference going? <laughs> It's been a lot of fun, and I'm getting an opportunity to meet a lot of people. I, I know their voices, mm -hmm. but I don't. In most cases, I don't know what they look like. And you know, as I'm walking down the hall, I'll hear somebody say something, and I'll I'll kind of recognize who they are. But <laughs> um, but otherwise, I wouldn't have any idea. But yeah, it's a lot of fun and meeting a lot of people, and you know, just getting to learn a lot of stuff too. Because as podcasters, I think we spend a lot of time by ourselves or mm -hmm. you know, just working yeah. on our podcast and there's not a lot of interaction with other people. So just having the ability to hear what other people are doing and their take on everything is very interesting because I can relate to a lot of it, but yeah. some of it is, is kind of surprising too. Yeah, there's a real range of people. I mean, I know that from listening to podcasts, but hearing people and how they're, what they're producing and how they're producing it and the big teams or the people who do really produce stuff or it's a very there's a wide range yeah and for me it's always been just me i mean mm -hmm. in the very beginning it's been uh you know i do the research i write the script i <laughs> read it i edit it i post it if there's a technical problem i have to address that if people yeah. send me emails questions i respond to it so it's very you can become very isolated mm -hmm. yeah. and mm -hmm. you can form some good habits, but you can form bad habits too. And sometimes it's good to interact with other people and kind of break some of those bad habits and see what they're doing. Yeah. And just, or to find out that there's, there's an easier there's way of doing way something exactly. that mm -hmm. you hadn't thought of because yeah. mm -hmm. you had nobody to work yeah. it through with. Yeah, no, exactly. Yeah. And it's just, and it is also just pleasant to talk to people yeah. who are also have the same sort of weird obsessive yeah. concerns about particular <laughs> yeah. things like yesterday sitting around and talking about, odd emails that we get saying. <laughs> well, that's an interesting, and you, again, you think as a podcaster that I'm the only one getting these kinds of emails. Right. It's yeah. got to be yeah. just me. And then you realize that everybody's getting the same emails. Yeah. And, you know, fortunately for me, 99% of them were positive. Mm -hmm. And I think that's the experience with most other podcasters. Yeah. Overwhelmingly, yeah. you get positive feedback. And I, I'm, I have to say, I get very little negative feedback, but you do sometimes get odd questions mm -hmm. and, uh, one of the things I encounter is people very often assume I'm more of an expert than I really am. Right. Uh, because, so they're asking a bunch of other questions. Yeah, I'm very yeah. quick to point out that, you know, I'm not a linguist. <laughs> I'm not you know, an academic. I don't have a degree in English or history. My background is law. I'm still a practicing attorney. Mm -hmm, so, mm -hmm. you know, I know what I know. I know what I've researched. Uh, I know what I've talked about in episodes. And I have a pretty general idea of everything I haven't talked about in terms of where the story goes and mm -hmm. how I'm going to tell it. But uh, very often I get questions, very specific technical questions about <laughs> language. And I just have to say, you know, I, I'm not the best person to answer that question. You need to go talk with uh, Mark Raven or somebody else. It's not me. Yeah, so. not me either. Yeah. <laughs> Mark's yeah. the best with that. But yeah, yeah, I, I can understand that. Yeah. <laughs> so how did you first become interested in the history of English? Yeah. Well, you know, I think I think I've 
thought about that a lot in retrospect since I started doing the podcast because I get asked that question a mm -hmm. lot. <laughs> and uh, as I think back on it, I went to high school a long time ago. It was over 30 years ago. And there's very little that I remember from high school in terms of specific lectures at specific days. I, all that information is filtered in and, and you know, it's just a big blur at this point. But there was one class I specifically remember sitting in it and the lecture. It was ninth grade, mm -hmm. Miss Murphy's class. <laughs> it was an English class. Mm -hmm. And it was a, sort of an English literature class. And it began really at the beginning with Beowulf. Hmm. Wow. It was, of course, that's, I guess, where you would tend to begin that type of course. And If you're lucky. <laughs> and, and at that time... There was, uh, in the corner of the room, was always the TV with the VCR yep. that we never got right. to use. And we always look forward to the day when the teacher rolled that out because <laughs> that was the day. It was sort of a day off. You could just sit back and watch TV. And, of course, it was VCRs. It was long before yeah. DVDs came out. <laughs> and so on this particular day, Miss Murphy rolled out the TV and put a videotape in the VCR. And it was a videotape about Old English. And it was the mm. first time I think I had ever heard anyone speak right. Old English. And it was sort of an, an epiphany because I, I knew that language changed. I knew that language was different. If you read Shakespeare, you know it's different. Mm -hmm. But I never really understood how much it changed, mm -hmm. that the original version of the language was so different that it did, really did not sound anything like modern <laughs> English. It was pretty much a different language altogether. And that was the first time I actually, like I said, I heard someone speaking Old mm -hmm. English. I'm sure it was part of Beowulf. So that kind of stuck with me. And even though I wasn't a big... English nerd. I mean, I didn't, I read what I had to read in English. I took the test. I did okay. I passed the classes, but it wasn't my favorite subject, but that stuck with me. Then when I got to college a few years later, I took a course called language and culture. It was an, Ooh. it was a anthropology course. Mm -hmm. It wasn't an English course yeah. and it was just sort of an elective. It was taught by a professor named Walt Wolfram, who is still one of the leading experts on American accents and dialects. Mm. And I was just fascinated by it. It wasn't my major, but it was a, a course about how language influences culture and reflects culture, how they work together. We're and, very fond of such yeah. things, yes. <laughs> and so, again, that was probably the second sort of epiphany I yeah. had, that how language is a part of culture and uh, that aspect of it interested me. That was also the first time I was introduced to the proto-Indo-European language, the right. idea that English is older than English. I mean, it goes yeah. back even further. Right. And uh, we didn't really cover it in any detail, but I was introduced to the concept. So that's probably where it began. And from there, I've always had that interest. Mm -hmm. And along the way, you know, I've always wanted to know why. You know, I'm not all that crazy about all the particular rules of English, the grammatical rules. Spelling is crazy a lot of times. But I always wanted to know why. Why is it that way? Mm -hmm. And that was something that wasn't generally taught in school. Yeah. Yeah. You're just taught, well, that's the rule. Yeah. And, right. yeah. I, and I realized at some point that the answer lies in the history. Mm -hmm. And so putting all these pieces together, realizing how much English had changed, language connection to culture, it all kind of played together. And, uh, and just through the years, having just you know read a little bit about it, having an interest in it. And I think the final component as far as why I decided to do a, a podcast about it, I always say the podcast really is a history podcast. It mm -hmm. just happens to be about English. You can do a history podcast about anything. And for me, in terms of, of putting all those pieces together, I, what fascinated me about the Indo-European, Proto-Indo-European language is that if you look at European history from a linguistic perspective, it ties together so many loose ends and strands. Right. Mm -hmm. Normally, you just learn about the Greeks. Then mm -hmm. you learn about the Romans. Then you learn about the Germanic tribes and, and maybe Charlemagne and the anglo -Sai. When you look at it from a linguistic perspective, you realize that they're all connected. Mm -hmm. The language they speak is all derived from the same common language and you know if you again if you can weave in that narrative that story mm -hmm. you you can kind of tell the history of the western world yeah. uh, in a ling you know, linguistic history and if you can weave in some etymology some you know linguistic you know, evolution it, it just is a fascinating story and I had never really seen it told that way mm -hmm. yeah so that's really where the idea for the podcast comes from it's just to kind of take that narrative and expand it. And with a podcast, there are no limits. You can take as much time as you want to and, and thoroughly examine it. Were there other podcasts that sort of made you want to 
do choose a, a podcast. Choose a podcast well, you see, I started my podcast pretty early on. Uh, I think the first episode was released in 2012, July of 2012. But I had been planning it for a year in advance and had recorded. Mm. Well, I had developed what was basically the Indo-European part of the podcast into the Greek, Latin, basically the pre-English part. Mm -hmm. And I kind of had an idea there. I was going to cover that in about 25 episodes. Then I was going to cover Old English in 25 episodes, <laughs> then Middle in 25 and Modern in 25. So I had this grand plan to cover it in 100. It was going to be this perfectly neat <laughs> series, 100 episodes, four quarters. I was going to take about a year for each one because I could do one episode every two weeks. Mm -hmm. Just just perfect plan. And then it all fell apart <laughs> once you actually get started <laughs> podcasting. But because uh, I'm now, what, uh, what, six years in, and I'm still not to Jeffrey Chaucer yet. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, to answer your question, uh, in, in terms of other podcasting, at, at the time I was listening to, uh, it was still relatively new. There weren't a lot of podcasts. Mm -hmm. And there, there were a few history podcasts I was listening to. I like Stuff You Miss in History, uh, mm -hmm. that podcast. There were a few other history ones I listened to. I knew that I was going to be covering a lot of English history. I mean, not English language, but the history of England. Mm -hmm. And as I was putting together this plan for about a year before I recorded the first episode, David Crowther started doing a podcast on the history of England. He mm -hmm. still does it. It's a wonderful podcast. And I realized then, oh, okay, so he's got that covered. I don't right. have to worry about detailing English history here. I can just focus on language. And it was kind of interesting when I first started my podcast, I think about two or three episodes in, one of the first emails I ever got from a listener was from David mm -hmm. saying how much he enjoyed what I was doing. And, right. and we've kind of been friends. In fact, I, I've done segments on his uh, podcast through the years a, a few times. But at any rate, uh, that's what really influenced me is the podcast I was listening to mm -hmm. at the time that were history related, but I was listening to other podcasts as well, some, you know, just sort of general entertainment comedy. And I still listen to a lot of different types of podcasts mm -hmm. when I have time. <laughs> um, but, but no, I, for me, it was, I'm not an interviewer. I've never interviewed anyone on the podcast. It's, it's me just sort of reading a script for the mm -hmm. most part, even though the f earlier episodes, I, I had a, a, you know, a looser script and improvised a little bit more. But but it's the format is is kind of the way I conceived of it then. It's still that way today. Yeah. So you said you I, you, I remember I remember when I was catching up on your um, when I first started listening and listening to those early ones and the plan you had. And by that point, mm -hmm. you'd already done enough episodes that I could look ahead in the queue and be like, eh, mm -hmm. no, that didn't happen. <laughs> yeah. So what? you had the sort of the original plan. Um, how's it changed as you've been working sure. on it and well, structure? Like I said, the first. 25 or so episodes, I had a, a, a good idea before I ever began. Mm -hmm. So those reflect kind of the idea I had. Then I knew I was going to have to transition into Old English. Mm -hmm. And I knew that, you know, there are certain basic things you're going to cover there. You're going to cover Beowulf, you know, cover some of the other important works, some, some Anglo-Saxon history. But my concern was, how do I stretch this material out? out into 25 episodes. If this is my plan, I've got to figure out how to cover Old English and, and cover it in 25 episodes. I wasn't worried about not having enough time. I was worried about how am I going to stretch it out and make it fit. <laughs> because there's comparatively yeah. not that much yeah. text for yeah. the Anglo-Saxon period. Very, yeah. There's relatively little surviving text. Mm -hmm. uh, the period, I knew just the, the general parts of Anglo-Saxon history, mm -hmm. but I thought there Vikings invade, Can't and be that much, really. you know, then you know they're <laughs> conquered by the Normans. So you kind of mm -hmm. know the general history. And once I got there and started thinking about how to tell that story, the podcast kind of changed a little bit, mm -hmm. and I had to improvise. And what I realized is that if I if I did the research on the history and looked at the particular time frame, because I do it a chronological story, so if I'm covering a particular decade or twenty year period, and look. Focus on the history, certain themes would emerge. Right. And then I could use the theme as a jumping off point, and I could introduce Old English words related to that theme and just kind of tie it all together mm -hmm. and try to tie in, as I always do, a little bit of etymology that is related to the time period that I'm discussing. Mm -hmm. So it was just a way of trying to weave together a historical narrative with what was happening in English and, and building around a theme. So what I ended up with is kind of this, a little bit of an odd approach. Most podcasts either follow a strict chronological story if they're history, mm -hmm. 
or they work around themes. Mm -hmm. Today's episode is about this, and next time we're going to talk about that. And so what I ended up doing essentially was sort of blending that together a little bit Mm -hmm. so that each episode had a self-contained theme within Mm -hmm. it, but was also part of an ongoing chronological story. And once I was able to kind of figure that out, then I realized I could do this forever. And (laughs) and so what was going to be 25 episodes ended up being 30 or 40 episodes, or Mm -hmm. however many it is. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and do you foresee it having, well, you won't know till you get there, really, but once you're past the Middle English period and you're into, when you start getting into global English, really, <laughs> like, you know, with Renaissance, essentially, right. after, as soon as you start getting into North America and all of that, um, do you have any thoughts about how that's going to affect what you're doing, or is it, you'll just have to... I do, because I think about it all the time. (laughs) (laughs) The story from up until the modern English period is just continuing along with with what I've Mm -hmm. been doing, same Mm -hmm. approach. But as I get closer to the transition from middle into modern English, everything will change Mm -hmm. because English really fractures at that point. And that's when you have modern English dialects and accents emerging. So you have to tell that part of the story. Mm And, and that's one of the great things about podcasting is it, you can't really tell that story very well in written form because how do you really convey accents yes. and how accents have changed? You can do that in a podcast form, but how do you do it in a podcast? I'm not... Uh, you know, uh, I'm not an impersonator. <laughs> You're not every single I can't, I can't, I can, accent. I can't do accents very well. So realizing that a long time ago, I realized the only way to do it would be to have listeners contribute their own accent samples, voice samples. Mm -hmm. So now it's been, I don't know, a couple of years ago, I started asking listeners to do that. And I have a page on my website, (laughs) historyofenglishpodcast.com, where anybody can go and just leave a a sample. And and right now I have some various sentences there. Mm -hmm. They don't have to read the sentences, but I encourage them to do that because the sentences are designed to pick up on differences between accents, vowel pronunciations Mm -hmm. mainly. So I'm collecting those, archiving those. There are other archives of accents and dialects maintained by universities and other nonprofits, but, and and I, and I may use them sometimes, but that gets into some copyright issues Mm -hmm. and complications. So I just wanted to to create my own database. Mm -hmm. And as I go forward, I'm going to rely, start to rely more and more on that. So Mm -hmm. I think listeners will start to hear other people talking Mm -hmm. rather than just me. And I've actually done that recently in recent episodes, I started to talk about how northern English accents yeah. are different from southern right. English accents and in telling, just sort of introducing that. That's the fundamental break you start with, mm-hmm. and then you kind of start tracing out from there. And so that was one of the things that I, I in, in telling that story, I was able to bring in some of those voice samples. Mm-hmm. And uh, I thought, you know, okay, this is sort of how it's going to work going forward if, if I continue to do it. Yeah, I really enjoyed that. We were we were just about to leave for England to visit <laughs> mm-hmm. England and visit the North and the South, and mm-hmm. your episode on that came out like right before it. And yeah. I was sitting there going, yeah. "Hey, that's Ma- we're going to be in Manchester." <laughs> but that's a good <laughs> example exciting. of how you know, in putting the podcast together. And I know at, at some point I'm going to introduce it. So where do I do it? Why, mm-hmm. At what point in the story? So in that particular episode, I was talking about a Northern English text, mm-hmm. Cursor Mundi, which is a very well, sort of well-known among English scholars, mm-hmm. Middle English texts, but it's well-known because it exists in a northern dialect. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So, oh, okay, now I can introduce that. Mm-hmm. And then it's followed up with text from southern England in, this, in the next episode that I can focus on a little bit. And then right after that came the Bruce, which yes. is considered mm-hmm. the first uh, significant piece of literature written in the Scots dialect. Mm-hmm. So I was able to sort of talk about that a little bit too. So right there within the course of those three episodes, we've got a fundamental s- division between Southern English, Northern English, and Scottish English, or mm-hmm. really Scots, not mm-hmm. really Scottish English, Scots, which is a more distinct form of English. And again, some people would argue if you say yeah. it's a form of English, they would say it's its own language. Yeah. But uh, again, that's something I'll try. I've always avoided that discussion in the, in the podcast. <laughs> I've always said, English, or a language or dialect, you know, whatever you want to call it, but I'm not going to resolve that debate, at least not yet. <laughs> no, you're going to get to that. That's going to happen again yeah. as you go yeah. forward, of course. Well, it gets into the deeper issue of what is language, what yeah. is a dialect. Yeah. Yeah. And that, I think, deserves its own 
discussion, yeah. mm-hmm. and I'll reserve it for that. And and what I think will surprise a lot of people is people, uh, average listeners will assume that that is a linguistic distinction, <laughs> yeah. and it's not. It's a cultural distinction, mm-hmm. political, it's a political distinction. Very distinction. Often, yeah. 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 So there's a lot of other factors that go into this distinguishing mm-hmm. accent or dialect from language. So are you anticipating certain dialects or accents that will be difficult to, to find someone? Well, Is there a particular <clears throat> call you need to yeah. put out for? All right, I Should need these be? six people. So every <laughs> once in a while, I'll ask listeners, I'll remind mm-hmm. listeners to do it. And, and most recently when I've done that is I've basically said, if you speak a standard mm-hmm. form of English, standard American accent, sort of a standard received pronunciation British accent, Canadian, Australian. I don't really need any more of those because mm-hmm. I've got a lot of those. Mm-hmm. What I need are unique regional accents. Mm-hmm. And so I do have quite a few of those, but I'm always inviting people to do that. And yeah, I mean, really beyond that, from any part of the world, I would take them, but I especially would love to get more samples from Northern England, mm-hmm. which has tremendous variation. Very, very local. From almost yeah. from town to town. Yeah. So I still have quite a few, but I could always use more from there. And then I'm, I've kind of been surprised in terms of the United States. I've not gotten as many regional accents mm. as I thought I would. 90% of what I've gotten is standard American English, mm-hmm. even from listeners in the South. And that this points to a whole other issue, mm-hmm. which is the gradual erosion of local accents mm-hmm. and dialects. So even when someone from you know, Alabama or Georgia leaves an accent, well, I'm from the South, and I can hear the accent and, and go, that's... You know, that's not that region. That's, that's pretty close to standard American English, mm-hmm. even though they will say in their introduction, I've lived here my whole life. And it, a lot of it is difference between urban and rural. Yeah, right. If you live in an urban area, you're going to not have much of a regional accent. But if you're from a rural area, you're going to have more of it. So I, it, that means I need more people who live in rural areas of not just the South, but other parts of the country to contribute. Mm-hmm. And again, uh, people... I mean, Experts will say there is a difference between the dialect of you know Eastern North Carolina and Western North Carolina. Right. Um, so we could a, get really yeah, granular yeah, if you. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I, I'm probably not going to get into that much detail. Mm-hmm. Uh, that's that's the subject of you know, university lectures. <laughs> yeah, and, or you know, it could be right. its own podcast of just you know tracing yeah. every yeah. single regional yeah. accent in the U.S. <laughs> so just to, to have more variation. That's yeah. always the key. Yeah. And so yeah. And then there's global English is like. Getting speakers, English speakers from India yeah, and, and I, Singapore. I have and samples stuff. Yeah, of that yeah. as well. It's a whole different. That it's is not so much about ac- I mean, it's accent yeah. too. It's not the so question much for accent. me is deciding when to, to end the story. Mm-hmm. Yeah, because I'm definitely going to cover modern English. You know, the the development of American English. You know, Canadian English, mm-hmm. Australia, New Zealand, India. You know, where where English is still a primary language spoken in the world today. Uh, but do I take it all the way to, you know, the, the 21st century mm-hmm. and, and, you know, at some point it ceases to be a history of English podcasts and it starts to become a, you know, a present or future of English podcast. Mm-hmm. And so I don't know yet what I'm going to do with that. Well, if you take long enough to do it, it'll, the history will write itself. It'll change itself. Yeah. <laughs> you'll all, it you'll changes, already be looking yeah, back yeah, on yeah. it. Yeah. 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 Well, cause this, it's also, I mean, language is always developing, but there's, sort of new things like when you're teaching your course on uh, the uh, online language, online language. You know, is this whole thing now and is it far enough back yet to be history or yeah. are we still figuring it out and that's the thing it's constantly changing mm-hmm. So. Mm-hmm. and there have been people who have done projections of what and i think some of them are a little dubious but what english will be like in 50 years mm-hmm. and that kind of thing but mm-hmm. uh, and I, I actually have some of the uh, research on that, which is fascinating in trying to project. I know in, in part of it, I was looking at it recently, was a projection about the pronunciation of, of numbers hmm. and how English numbers will sound. It's just a, an educated guess, you know, maybe a, a century or two from now. And so I remember one of them was suggesting that 50 mm-hmm. would become 50. Right. Yeah, kind of like which, 50 cent. You know, which yeah. it is yeah. already in yeah. some in So some things like that, so. how, you know, the, the change within English, linguistic change, tends to follow certain repeating patterns. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And I guess the argument is made that certain sound changes happen one way. They don't tend to always happen the other way. Mm-hmm. And just looking at that history and the tendencies that occur, 
sometimes you can predict where the language is going to go. Mm -hmm. And uh, so that was very interesting. I have a, a separate Patreon site that I do a page, and I do bonus episodes on there. And uh, the reason I was looking at some of that research is because I think I'm going to do a bonus episode at some point on uh, the future, future of being, or, you know, where that's going to go. Yeah. Sometimes I use that material just to sort of you know increase my own knowledge because I'm learning mm -hmm. along the way. That's, mm -hmm. that's the, with me not being an academic, you know, I learn along with the listeners a lot of times mm -hmm. and I'm discovering new stuff. And, and sometimes I come across things like that. And I don't want to wait until I get there. <laughs> yeah. so I want it's to go like ahead four and years share it. Yeah. Yeah. So, I, so I, that, <laughs> that ends up being a great place where I can just say, you know, talk about something that's outside mm -hmm. the normal yeah. narrative. Mm -hmm. And sometimes I go back in time because that's the other thing about a chronological narrative is once you've gone past a certain point in time, you can't really go back unless yeah. you're very creative yeah. and find a way to, to bring it back in. Yeah. But with the, the bonus episodes I sometimes do, I can go back and revisit things. That I, one of the things, you didn't ask me this question, but I'm going to give us you an anyway. answer anyway, <laughs> um, is if I have any, any regrets. Because mm -hmm. sometimes someone will ask me, is there anything that I, if I could go back, would I redo it? And the answer is yes. <laughs> the episodes I did on the Greeks. No, I I only did two or three episodes on the Greeks. I could have done twenty episodes mm -hmm. on the Greeks, and that's a good example of that was before I figured out how to tell the story. Right, right. right. There were so many opportunities there to take what was happening in history and build in Greek words related to that and develop that into you know words we have in English. Right, the thema sort of thematic yeah, clusters absolutely. of stuff. Yeah. That's I mean, I could I didn't I didn't really talk about very much. I talked about the Trojan War just sort of briefly in the context of the episode, but there's so much there to explore between the Iliad and the Odyssey. So much etymology, so many mm -hmm. words that mm -hmm. come. The word Odyssey itself, you, yes. know, yeah. um, you know, there's so many etymology there. And one thing that I did end up doing a bonus episode at Patreon uh, was about Sappho and mm -hmm. love songs and mm -hmm. some of that etymology. Those were things that, in retrospect, I wish I had done, but right. it's now, you know, I've gone past it. <laughs> uh, so at any rate, that's just, mm -hmm. that's just the nature of a chronological story. You know, you, you sometimes yeah. you, you just miss stuff. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So backtracking to Proto-Indo-European, that's often not included in discussions of the history of English, but it sounds like you were already sort of aware of that. Was that a, a decision on your part right at the beginning that you, you wanted to tell the whole story as far as could be told? So in, as you may have discerned from my comments earlier, the way I conceived of the podcast was as much a Proto-Indo-European podcast right. as mm -hmm. an English podcast. Mm -hmm. That's what I was fascinated because that's, again, if you start there, mm -hmm. there's so many different historical narratives you, that come out of that. Mm -hmm. yeah. And that was the part of the story that had never been told. Yeah, there were books about Proto-Indo-European from a linguistic perspective, the language trying to discern when it was spoken, where it was spoken, what the reconstructed words were, uh, what the culture looked like. But I, I really did not come across any books or material in my research where someone had taken that and then just developed it out mm -hmm. into Greek, into Latin. And, and that was what I thought, why has this not been done? And so, you know, I, I, that was sort of the, the idea that I had. And that's why I had the first, the pre-English part laid out in advance and didn't really know where I was going to go after that. <laughs> right. The, you're right, though, in, in, in telling and in calling the podcast the history of English, it's it's a little bit misleading. And I always say it's sort of an inside not so much an inside joke, but anyone who listens to the podcast quickly realizes the title's misleading because the history of English is only part of the story. I don't even get to English <laughs> until episode 27 or 28. But the reason I gave detail. that, well, the reason I gave that is partly because you got to have a short title. Yeah. yeah. If I, if I could have called it the, the history of English and the English speaking peoples, it might've been better, but Winston Churchill already had that title. <laughs> so I mean, I don't know the linguistic history of the Western world. Well, that's too broad. I don't cover all the other languages, but it really wasn't a short, concise way of saying it other than just calling it the history of English. But, but that, yeah, the idea of starting with, with Indo-European, Proto-Indo-European, because what a lot of people don't realize is that the language we speak today is a mixture of words pulled from different languages. We have native words that came from Old English, but we have a lot of words that came from French, from Latin, from Greek. A lot of words went through all of those before they got to English. They went from Greek to Latin to French mm -hmm. into English. But in many cases, the words that English borrowed in are just different versions of the words we already had in English. Mm -hmm. And that was just a fundamental idea that I had to introduce. And so the, 
the first episodes introduce that. And, you know, there's a the classic example, everybody gives it, between father in English and pater in Latin or Greek. Mm-hmm. And, you know, you see it's it, ultimately it's the same root word mm-hmm. coming out of Indo-European. You just have a basic sound change that happens at the front. And it's not, that sound change is not unique to that word. Mm-hmm. It happens over and over and over again between, you know, ped and foot funeral pyre versus English fire. It just happens over mm-hmm. and over. You see it. So you know that this was a regular systematic sound change that occurred. And once you recognize, and, and of course the, the expert who really did that research was Jacob Grimm, mm-hmm. Grimm's you know, fairy tales. And once you identify the basic sound changes, well, he identified them, but once you take note of them, mm-hmm. It, it just sort of opens up this whole new world. And yeah. you start to realize how all these words that we use to have similar meanings, they're all just variations of the same word. Mm-hmm. Again, linguists know that. I mean, if you're an expert on, in you know, historical linguistics, you know that. Average, normal people don't really know that. No. And so to me, that's just the, that's the basic fundamental idea behind the podcast. It starts there, mm-hmm. is how interconnected our language is and and words and once you've identified that basic idea you start taking account you know, account of the sound changes how that influences spelling mm-hmm. how a certain sound change within latin or french influences words we have in english you know mm-hmm. i always give the example of wine and vine yes. or for yes. vineyard yeah. you know we english borrowed that word they're, they're latin words english borrowed wine very early on when it was still pronounced with a w at the mm-hmm. front but that sound changed in late Latin and French to a V sound. Mm-hmm. We borrowed it again as vine or you know, vineyard. And you go, oh, okay. Well, I know. I always thought about it. they're kind of similar, but yeah. who would have put them you, here? You, oh, often the you have word. sort of an intuitive feel uh, that they're connected, yeah. but yeah. you haven't spent. Uh, yeah, when we, when we teach or when I teach Latin, a big chunk, because I teach a lot of Latin to a lot of students who are not going to do very much Latin, really. They're yeah. going to do a year of it, yeah. whatever. But a big chunk of it is really trying to open that up and say, look, look at how this, you can actually, you know so much more Latin than you think you do. You know so much more English than you think you do. And once you've identified that, you start making these connections. The world starts to seem much more orderly than it did before. (laughs) It doesn't seem random anymore. Mm -hmm. And, oh, okay. And, And then spelling, the craziness that is English spelling actually can start to make a little bit of sense once yeah. you account for these basic, you know, historical trends. Mm-hmm. And you can make it really complicated and make it really dry, or you can make it fascinating and simple. And so I'm always trying to make it interesting mm-hmm. for listeners. And uh, I always say, you know, unlike the two of you, I'm not an academic. That's a disadvantage for me in some ways, but in other ways, it's a bit of an advantage mm-hmm. because I'm just an average person discovering this and communicating it to other people who don't have that academic background either. So I'm communicating it maybe in a way that they can understand a little bit easier and better. And I I hate using technical linguistic terms. I don't feel comfortable doing it because I'm not a linguist. I always apologize when I do it. (laughs) But example of that is Proto-Indo-European. I've used that term more sitting here with you in the last half hour or so than I've used it in 117 episodes of the podcast. (laughs) I almost never call it Proto-Indo-European. I always call it the original Indo-European language. Right. Because that's what they're all means, every so. you know, all these European North South Asian languages fall in, under this general heading of Indo European languages. But it was the first one. The, well, mm-hmm. you know, we assume we reconstructed it's it. It's as far as theoretical. back as we can go, yeah. 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 But yeah. it's it's the original Indo European. Yeah. But, but when you say proto Indo European It makes it sound hard. Oh, yeah. What is that? Proto Indo that sounds like some you know, something you read out of some dry textbook. But no, it's just the it's where we start. That's mm-hmm. the original. Mm-hmm. So I'm always thinking about that uh, and trying to avoid any kind of technical terminology right. and, and keeping the language simple. I'm not saying academics don't do that. I'm just saying you, you have to maybe... You yeah, have it's, to, it's yeah. not a habit. <clears throat> you it, have to a, deconstruct to be, yeah. it a little bit to do that. And get, I got to get out of it. I always say it's what muscle are you using? I got to mm-hmm. kind of get rid of the muscle where I'm usually talking to students at this level. Mm-hmm. I've got to look at it a little bit different way. Mm-hmm. And I, and I do try to do that because I'm an, I'm an attorney mm-hmm. and I'm always talking with clients. Uh, I do a lot of tax law, estate planning. So I'm dealing a lot of times with older clients and I'm having to deal with very technical tax issues, you know, federal (laughs) tax law. 
And I realized a long time ago that you cannot use technical terms. Mm -hmm. You just have to, how am I going to explain this in plain English? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and that's what I've tried to do. And that's, I've tried to apply the same approach to the podcast. And yeah, I mean, I, I know that there are probably some academics and experts who cringe at the way I, I do things or phrase things. Sometimes it's probably out of ignorance on my part. Sometimes it's intentional because mm -hmm. I call it rounding off the edges. I'm mm -hmm. trying to simplify things if I can. Because I think people who listen to podcasts are very, it's a very different process from reading a book. Mm -hmm. When you read a book, you're engrossed in the book. You can go back. You, if I read a, I can go back and read that earlier sentence. In a podcast, people are walking the dog, doing the dishes, driving the car. A lot of times they're half listening. Mm -hmm. And once you've made a point, you can't really go back and listen to it. It's tough to do that. So it's important to try to keep it simple, keep it moving, not get bogged down too much in details mm -hmm. if you can. That's the general approach that I've used. And so far, you know, so yeah. far it's okay. It's, it's, it's worked hard. okay for you, yeah. I think. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. when you're dealing with something long running like a podcast, as opposed to, say, an audio book, you could go to the trouble of introducing a technical term. But, you know, if you introduce it, will, will they remember 20 episodes yeah. later right. when there's, you know, you have to wait in between it, each episode. And so then it gets clunky because then you have to re-explain the term every time you use it. Yeah. And there's one term that I, I did use early on. And again, I kind of apologized for using it, but it was a sibilation, mm, also mm -hmm. known as palatalization. Mm -hmm. yeah, ne but, ne neither word is a friendly word. <laughs> yeah. But it's, it's basically, as I described it, moving a sound from the back of the throat to the front of the mouth. So it mm -hmm. makes more of a hissing sound mm -hmm. or you know, somewhere along that line. A sibilation from sibilant. You know. So yeah, I introduced the term. That's what it means. Now I basically told listeners, you don't have to remember it anymore. I just want to make sure you know what the word is. But from that point on, I didn't really try to use it much anymore. And again, that's just me just A, being uncomfortable using mm -hmm. linguistic terms to begin with, and B, just trying to introduce the idea and concept, and then we'll work with the concept. We're mm -hmm. not worried about the terminology that much. Yeah, the labeling isn't, yeah. isn't labeling is useful if it helps you explain the concept, yeah. because yeah. you have to say there's a thing, yeah. and it has a label. But the label's not really what the label is doesn't really matter right once you've sort of said that yeah and then that's when I mean, we, we talked about this before but um you know that's what you do when you're teaching anyway but when you're teaching a class part of what you're trying to do is build their vocabulary mm -hmm. and build their you know skill set right. so you build on it and then you can by the end of the class you can expect them to know the things yeah. you taught them at the beginning and of course in some ways people are doing that with your podcast yeah. but you can't Rely, you know, you're not testing them. You, they exactly. don't have to remember it. it There's, I do not have a, a, a syllabus to go yeah. by. I don't. I'm not going to test anybody. Mm -hmm. You don't have to remember this. And again, that's a, a this whole conference is mm -hmm. about sound education, mm -hmm. where podcasters, you know, meet academics, and you're kind of both worlds. But in a lot of cases, those of us who do podcasts are not academics, mm -hmm. you know, and so. Mm -hmm where do the two meet? And, you know, for me, I always say that, excuse me, anybody can do a podcast. You just have to take it seriously. You got to do the research. You got to listen to feedback, constructive criticism, mm -hmm. have a thick skin. If somebody says to you, 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 you said that wrong, you did that wrong. You were, you know, you're just wrong on that concept. Then if they're, if they're right, you just have to say you're right, you know? Okay. Mm -hmm. And I'll just do better going forward. And that's how you have to deal with it. Mm -hmm. and, and that's how I deal with it. Mm -hmm. I'm always worried when I have a Dutch word to pronounce because <laughs> it comes up reasonably often because there's a fair amount of Dutch borrowings in English yeah. and uh, Dutch, it's, it's just it, hard. It's a hard, hard one to do. Well, and we have one particular very, you, you know, a loyal and f very supportive listener who is Dutch and who's, it's very nice, but always calls us yeah. out when so, they get the Dutch wrong. <laughs> what I should do is, is contact him <laughs> just, in advance. You should just get him to read that read word that for you every yeah. time. <laughs> yeah. So this comes up a lot because I deal a lot with other languages. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And what I've learned a long time ago is, first of all, there's a general disclaimer I've given a few times in mm -hmm. the podcast, which is that don't focus too much on pronunciation. This is not a podcast about precise technical pronunciation of mm -hmm. words. I'm telling a, a larger story mm -hmm. here. So, you know, let's not get too lost in the <laughs> weeds and, and we could go on forever for every word and how it's pronounced. And even modern English mm -hmm. that we all speak, we all pronounce words differently. Yes. Okay. So I, I acknowledge that, yeah, there's a, a proper pronunciation of some foreign words that I'm using in the, in the podcast. The, the good thing about it is that these days you can generally go online and find the right pronunciation. 
And depending on the language, I can get pretty close. Mm -hmm. Uh, Sometimes I butcher it. I remember that I used, talked about the Gaelic word, well, the word Mm -hmm. slogan Mm -hmm. comes from Gaelic. Mm -hmm. So I wanted to get the original Gaelic pronunciation as best as I could. And I listened online to that pronunciation. I know I listened to it a hundred times. And I still can't pronounce it. The sounds are just not in English. Mm -hmm. My mouth will not make those sounds. Mm -hmm. So it was some like slurigum or something. But I I, and I said I know that's butchering it. But you get you know you get the idea. Mm -hmm. It isn't important for what I'm doing to get an absolute perfect precise pronunciation. Mm -hmm. Again, if if this was a if I was charging money for what I'm doing, (laughs) I'd 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 feel guilty and I'd probably focus on that a little bit more. I just want to get you in the neighborhood of what it sounds yeah. like. Just so, because that's not the key part of the story. The key part is that I want you to know this word sounded different. It came from somewhere else. Mm-hmm. And uh, and you know, let's not get too lost in the weeds on pronunciation. But listeners are always going to give you that feedback. Mm-hmm. And I get that all the time. You know, the word that I always point to is cavalry, mm-hmm. um, <laughs> which I always, in the earlier episodes, that comes up a lot. When yeah. you're talking about a fair uh, of it. Middle English history <laughs> or Middle Middle Ages, yeah. and so I pronounce it like a lot of Americans do as Calvary, mm-hmm. and thought nothing of it. And that was just one of those words that when you listen to your voice back, it's always a shock, and you realize mm-hmm. words that you pronounce in an odd way, sounds you don't make, sound mm-hmm. that yeah. D. <laughs> I always struggle to get the D on mm-hmm. the end. I say sound fifty times in every episode, <laughs> yeah. so I now always go sound. I try to get it in there every time, but I don't. But anyway, Calvary. So I I don't know how many emails I've gotten from listeners about pronunciation Mm -hmm. of Calvary. And I became so paranoid over that. that, And it's tough for me to do that. You you want a a technical term, you know, metathesis Mm -hmm. there. You're switching sounds. And so... I work, I have to literally work. Anytime I get to that word, I slow down and go cavalry because mm. my mouth just doesn't want to make that sound. But I became paranoid about it. And anytime anybody said that word, I you would listen listening. to it. And I realized, I thought it was just me. You know, I'm just my accent. And I realized almost every time I hear that word pronounced, at least on American television, mm-hmm. it's cavalry. And so I realized mm-hmm. it's not me. You know, I shouldn't have been so, I, I shouldn't have felt so bad about my pronunciation because it, I'm just using what is basically the standard American pronunciation, or, or very common well, yeah, American a, a pronunciation. Well, yeah, a widespread yeah. Yeah, pronunciation. I won't say standard, but it's a very common pronunciation. In my experience, since I listen to it, it's 90% of the time I hear it, so mm-hmm. I'd say it's more than just common. But mm-hmm. but nevertheless, what you realize is, is I appreciate the feedback, and, and listeners were right to say you're pronouncing it wrong, but it wasn't really wrong because no. a lot of people pronounce it that way. Yeah. And so you just kind of, at some point, you just kind of, that's why I say you kind of have to get a thick skin mm-hmm. and at some point say, okay, okay, well, I, I hear you and I'll try to do better. But Or you decide, you also have to decide what matters, what matters to you. Because yeah. what matters to the listeners is always going to be a little different than what matters to you. Some people listening are going to really care about one thing yeah. and only that thing. And you have to decide if that's So my episodes are scripted. Mm-hmm. And they are more scripted now than they were at the beginning for that reason. Because when I started the podcast, it was a history of English podcast. But like I said, to me, it was a history podcast. Mm -hmm. It just happened to be about English. Naively, I mean, I thought every I thought ninety percent of the people who listen will be history buffs, right? <laughs> but it was called the history of English, so it ended up being it's more like probably fifty fifty. But fifty percent of the people are English buffs, mm-hmm. and mm-hmm. they tend to be very picky about English, and mm-hmm. you know. So I, I did more improvising in the earlier episodes, having more of an outline, and would just sort of make comments along the way. And uh, yeah, I got feedback about grammatical stuff, and I don't say sort of or kind of a lot Mm -hmm. but i think i must have said it a few times along the way and i i get i've just i got literally angry emails from a couple listeners about don't say sort of or kind of and i thought they were going to be complaining that you said sorta or something no No? they don't want the phrase uh, at all no no, not good not good don't do that and and again it's not like sort of sort of you know because i hear people do that kind of like 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 you know like i went like and it does get annoying i get that but i'm talking maybe once or twice in an episode and i thought about it and you get that your initial response when you get the email is man you know was it that bad then i realized no it wasn't you know Mm -hmm. that's how people talk Mm-hmm. And and today when I write an episode, sometimes I just put it in there intentionally because it <laughs> yeah. sounds right, you yeah. know, for what I'm doing. Yeah. So little things like that. I've gotten uh, some people say actually, 
don't say you know, actually too oh. much because people do overuse actually a lot. Again, I don't think I overuse it, but maybe in an episode or two I did. But I, that's the feedback. I've gotten feedback. You don't always, always use which and that yeah. correctly. Uh, it really is strange that people treat it so much as if, as if you're yeah. writing. I mean, even exactly. in writing, frankly, I don't care about that distinction either. But yeah. okay, fine. But when you, I know it's scripted, yeah. but you're speaking. But that's, people don't speak that's like the that. point. Yeah. Uh, I, was, I think you know, I wanted to make, which is that we don't write the way we speak. Mm-hmm. And at some point you have to realize that writing tends to be a more formal mm-hmm. way of speaking. And it's and, got a different set of yeah, rules, yeah. basically. And so it's very different. And and that goes back to you know my initial interest in language mm-hmm. because I was taught in school, don't do this, don't use double negatives, don't split your infinitives, mm-hmm. don't in a sentence in a preposition. These are the rules of English. Mm-hmm. Yet no one follows those rules when they speak. <laughs> no. Why is this the rule of English? Yeah. Where did that come from? So this gets back to the original kind of idea and interest mm-hmm. I had. I was taught the rules. I had some interest in the rules. I tried to speak as well as I could. But what I was really interested in is where those rules came from. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And, and so, they never tell you that. <laughs> and what you, what you learn in many cases, that a lot they of times know. the rules are random. Yeah. That, in, in many or cases, they come about yeah. for you know, one very yeah. specific reason that uh, one person yeah. decided he liked this or Some liked that. Some Latin and, scholar yeah. in the yeah. you know, 1700s. You know, double negatives, is a, don't use them. It's a perfectly logical mm-hmm. rule. Because two negatives can't... If you're a mathematics yeah, wizard, but, you know that. But language is yet, math. <laughs> yet, not only has English always mm-hmm. used double negatives, if you read Old English text, you'll find triple and quadruple negatives mm-hmm. used in the same sentence. They did not have a prohibition against mm-hmm. using more than one negative in a sense. It was yeah. a point of emphasis. Yeah. Yeah. And the funny so, thing about that is so many of these made-up rules are an attempt to apply Latin to English, exactly. right? But that one's not because there are double negatives in yeah. Latin. Latin yeah. will use a double negative to emphasize as well. So that one was just it, pure, it, I want the world to be logical, so yeah. I'm going to impose this thing that is un- totally unnatural. It's a product of an age when logic and mathematics and reason was applied to language. Mm-hmm. But language doesn't work that way. No, yeah. it never it, has, it, never will. It's not a product <laughs> of logic and reason. No. It's funny because a lot of the, a lot of other languages – don't seem to worry about that particular one. I mean, mm-hmm. in French, you, you, a lot of times you're required to use two negatives yeah. in a sentence. And, and I, nobody calls that a double no negative. They say that the way you do a negative is you put a ne and a pa, and yeah. it's that, that pair has to be in there. And nobody says, yeah, but like you're just saying no twice. Yeah. Yeah. So again, that to me is, is part of the fascination. I think what I, I get feedback from listeners who say, before I listen to your podcast, I was – you know, one of those people who went around and corrected everybody all the time <laughs> and pointed out all, all the mistakes they were making. Now I don't do that as much anymore yeah. because I think once you realize that the language we speak today, or at least the textbook version, mm-hmm. is not some perfect standard. I think this is the idea a lot of people have. Those rules that are written down in the grammar books and textbooks that we learned, this was how language was once spoken at some perfect point in the yes, past. Yes. This is the way people spoke English, and it has been corrupted ever since because we don't speak that way. And we as, you know, as, as English, as protectors and guardians of English, we have to do everything we can do to get people back to the state mm-hmm. when English was pure and good again. And once you realize that never existed. <laughs> it's all a myth. It's all theoretical. Yeah. People yeah. never spoke that way. These were a lot of them were just completely arbitrary rules mm-hmm. made up yeah. by academics that never applied to the general population. And you realize how not just the fact that English has evolved, but it's radically evolved over time. Mm-hmm. That you cannot you cannot read Beowulf today unless you've studied old English and you you know the eighty five percent of the vocabulary of old English is gone. Yeah. yeah. And so, you know, as I always say that the, the Language is different. The grammar, the syntax, the pronunciation, the letters were different mm-hmm. in Old English. And once you realize that that's how much language changed, and it's natural. Every language changes. And there was a high style at every level, yeah. right? Like it wasn't that there was a time when it was formal and now it's yeah. not formal. Or there was a time when it was not formal. and Like at every stage, yeah. there was fancy English and not fancy yeah. English. Well, this is the problem with, with Old English. Mm-hmm. You've got most of the surviving literature in it's Old fancy. English <laughs> was composed in one part of Britain, mm-hmm. in Wessex, which was the capital. The, the courtiers there, the, the scribes were trained in that standard, and they wrote in that standard. And the problem with that is you're only getting one dialect of Old English in most of the surviving literature. And even in other parts of the country, they probably wrote to that standard. They didn't mm-hmm. write in their own dialect. And so 
there was the Viking invasion mm -hmm. of the Anglo-Saxon period. The Vikings controlled whole portions of England, northern oh. eastern England, the Danelaw, they called it, and heavy Norse influence in the language there. Yet we don't see that in Old English text because the texts were written outside of the Dane law mm -hmm. in the other corner of the country. Yet scholars know that Old English had a lot of Norse influence in mm -hmm. there, even though we don't see it in Old English because after the Norman conquest, when English disappears for a while in writing, it starts to reappear around the late 1100s, 1200s, not using that old standard anymore. People just writing the way they speak Boom, suddenly all those words are there. Norse words everywhere. Yeah. And then they and, didn't come in yeah. in the 11th century. Yeah, they didn't just <laughs> pop in. The, Nor the Norse speakers had been there yeah. for several centuries. Yeah. We just can't see it in those older mm -hmm. texts. Mm -hmm. And, I mean, it's it's everywhere. The pronouns we use, mm -hmm. they, them, their, mm -hmm. are old, are they're Norse. They're not and English. that is the most bizarre, one of the most bizarre yeah. borrowings that we borrowed yeah. pronouns. Yeah. It's, and, that's such a strange thing to and do. And this gets back to the other idea that language is pure and doesn't change yeah. unless mm -hmm. it's corrupted. Well, it changes all the time. I and mean, you think one of the arguments I make early on is that we don't see as much change in the core vocabulary of English. The basic things we learn as small children mm -hmm. by the time we're in kindergarten or first grade. Body parts. Body parts, yeah. numbers, family members, mother, mm -hmm. father. Those not only tend to go back to Old English, they tend to go all the way back to the original Indo-European language. They don't change. Mm -hmm. Having said that, though, pronouns, you would think those are some of the most core words in the vocabulary. Mm -hmm. They've changed a lot over the centuries. Not only did we borrow wholesale all these Norse ones, but you, mm -hmm. you know, we only have one version of you, plural and singular. We didn't used to. We had thou and thee. It's disappeared. Mm -hmm. And we now, we now use you for both, which creates its own difficulties in modern English. And that may be changed. We don't even know where exactly where the word she came from. <laughs> she pops up in early Middle English. <laughs> Completely different from the you know the old English version, and there's still debate about how that came about, mm -hmm. and that may still be changing, because you know as as gender changes, we have an increasing need in English for a gender neutral mm -hmm. pronoun. We don't really have. We have it, but we don't like to use that for people, and we don't want to constantly say he or she did this, he or she. So these days we tend to use they, the singular they, mm -hmm. you know, instead of he and she. Well, that breaks some basic rules of grammar, but that's the way people speak because we don't have that gender Well, and in pronoun. fact, they've spoken like that for a long time yeah. Yeah, so it's very, in certain so contexts, the, yeah. The point being that this is just the nature, even within core basic words, mm -hmm. people don't realize how radically things have changed yeah. over the last few centuries. And it's just how language works. It's going to change. Yeah. It doesn't mean you go suddenly turn around tomorrow and start writing your formal essays in like whatever you yeah. want. I mean, it doesn't mean that we can't, we don't have a, we have common understanding mm -hmm. of the language at any given moment. But as you say, there's no well, perfect English. There's not. There isn't a thing that just stands it, there as yeah. this moment. Is the is it descriptive yeah. versus prescriptive? Yes. And I think you know. So what's the answer to that? Do we do we just let everybody say what they want to say mm -hmm. and not worry about it, or you know, do we try to strictly regulate? And I think the answer is the truth is always somewhere in the middle. Yeah. That's for almost any debate that there is there's truth <laughs> is know, somewhere very, in the middle very much and, like that and on so it, it, and so Students yeah you, yeah there need to be some basic rules yeah. because what happened to the proto-indo-european language what happened when it fractured what happened to latin when it fractured mm -hmm. into the romance languages what happened to the original proto-germanic language it fractured into english dutch scandinavian languages german that can happen to english mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. english is spread out around the world today so theoretically it could fracture and become distinct languages over time as well. So I do think that there is some need for a common standard that we all adhere to, to keep things together a little bit so we don't fracture. Just to be comprehensible. In the modern another. world, yeah. we're all in the connected via mm -hmm. you know, internet, television, media, popular mm -hmm. culture. So I think that tendency of language to fracture has been curtailed a little bit just by that fact alone. But... Yeah, it makes sense to have some basic rules of grammar in English, but you don't have to you know, lose sleep over it. You mm -hmm. don't have to be rude to somebody <laughs> it's just because they're using a slightly different you know, accent or mm -hmm. dialect. And you just recognize variation happens, but there's a, you know, just sort of a happy medium that mm -hmm. we're all trying to adhere mm -hmm. to. But if, if, you know, don't, yeah, it's, if it's you're able to communicate, it's yeah, comprehensibility, it's... And, you know, sometimes using the rules or thinking about some of the rules is about making sure that you are communicating not just the content, but 
the intent of what yeah. you're trying to say. So you want to not use a whole bunch of slang terms when you're trying to communicate how, you know, a, a formal greeting because the person won't get that from you. That That's where knowing rules and yeah. understanding them helps. But that doesn't mean you can't still be understood if you use slang or whatever. So, yeah, yeah exactly. No, it, we're it's very useful to be this, multi-dialectal, you know, yeah. as in addition to being multilingual, being multi-dialectal is useful. Mm -hmm. So you know what... You know, you have a, a particular dialect that you use casually with your friends and you have a different one that you use in a business context or whatever. And that's fine. And you're communicating with those people mm -hmm. what the, the, the paralinguistic stuff, the, the stuff around language, mm -hmm. the stuff about what are we doing here? What, what kind of relationship do we have? All of those things by choosing what kind of words you're going to use, yeah. what kind of how formal your grammar is going to be, those things. <laughs> that's all part of how we can part of communicating, too. Yeah. And, and this is part of the going back to something we mentioned earlier with the, the loss of local mm -hmm. accents and dialects, you know, it, in some ways as English becomes more of a global language in different parts of the world, some of these dialects are going to become more and more distinct and already in parts of the mm -hmm. South Pacific, you have pigeons and Creoles that have emerged there that mm -hmm. are really offshoots of English, but they're, they are distinct languages. I think you would have to mm -hmm. say at this point, but generally speaking, within the you know, the English speaking world, that the, where English is still you know the, the traditional dominant standard language, rather than it fracturing, I think it's actually becoming more homogenized mm -hmm. in some ways. Mm -hmm. Because as I said, a lot of regional accents are disappearing. Mm -hmm. I've talked about you know, I mentioned Scots earlier, mm -hmm. which is some people would argue is a distinct language, but. Certainly, over the past three or four centuries, it has eroded, mm -hmm. being replaced with just a, a just a Scottish form of English mm -hmm. that's you know an eroded accent it, rather than more a, of an language, accent yeah. than a dialect. And the same thing I think is happening, certainly in American English, mm -hmm. regional accents are, are eroding and disappearing uh, again as, as the country becomes. The rural areas become more urban. It's especially. also about mobility, the, yeah. the the actual mobility of people. So in England, you have these tiny, tiny regional, yeah. ultra specific dialects because for a very long time there was not a lot of mobility. And uh, you, I mean, that's a simpl it, a little simplistic, but basically it, people didn't leave. Yeah, and, in and now you do. Itself, you move all of, all over the you're place. You're seeing your life. standard received pronunciation mm -hmm. BBC English mm -hmm. kind of influence some of the northern dialects as well. I, in collecting voice samples, get samples from northern england first of all it's amazing how many people are not the accent they speak is not pure and mm -hmm. they'll tell you that right off the bat well i was born here but i moved here yeah. i've lived for a while and so it's it's very difficult to get good pure voice samples mm -hmm. because so many of the people who leave them have moved around yeah. and mm -hmm. so they don't have mm -hmm. that pure voice sample anymore but even among those who do i've noticed in northern england as i said there are certain sentences i use to try to pinpoint certain sounds and it, it's not consistent as mm -hmm. it as it should theoretically be. An you accent know, should be just something you do unconsciously. Therefore, it should come out in a consistent way. Yeah, yeah. The classic difference, one of the classic differences between Northern English and Southern English accents in England, is the the u sound, the cup mm -hmm. versus right. coop. Right. You know, that's got older rounded sound. Well, so when I get Northern accents, I'm always looking for coop. You know, the mm -hmm. ooh, lo, you know, the, the rounded ooh, and most of the time they're there, but not always. Hmm. And, I, and I know from just having researched and read literature that it's eroding in some hmm. parts of Northern England, influenced by what? received pronunciation. And people BBC moving around. Moving and, around. Yeah. and so I'm, I'm hearing that in the samples. Mm -hmm. And again, that makes it tough for me because I want to illustrate these mm -hmm. sound changes and it's tough to get good samples that really yeah, preserve when them. I, when mm -hmm. I was thinking about that, when you were saying you were doing the the, the, the sort of database, that, that one of the problems is is what you also want is historical. You want stuff from 50 years. Right. And obviously right. those people don't, I mean, if you could find people to go around and have them record their grandparents, that would help, but it's, but it's hard. Yeah. Because you're influenced by, again, movement, but again, popular mm -hmm. media and culture. Well, and also deliberate, right? Yeah. Because so there's so much exactly. classism well, in the world in general, but in the U S in the UK, it's really, yeah. when we were visiting, when we were talking to friends, I mean, they were, these are people our age who were talking about how they deliberately worked to, to re remove how when they went down south and worked in an office people laughed at them mm -hmm. daily yeah. about their the way they pronounced stuff until they stopped doing it so i mean they're they're not Absolutely. just unconsciously changing their conscious and it was interesting to hear them sort of uh people sort of have their two accent registers too they'll speak in one way and then they'll say 
then they'll turn to something that's very local or about something local or old or whatever. And suddenly they'll say three sentences in like a really heavy Manche- yeah. Mancunian dialect yeah. or whatever. Yeah. But but that's not how they speak daily because they've kind of trained that out of themselves. Yeah. Yeah. And a lot of people, when they're reading something and they know they're being recorded, mm-hmm. they, they go more yeah, they have a little more standard. formal yeah. in their mm-hmm. readings. So they're not necessarily reflecting the way they normally yeah. speak as well. So, yeah, that's a challenge. And, and in doing the, the podcast, when I recently did the episodes on Northern versus Southern English in Britain, I actually went back to the British Library archives mm-hmm. because they preserve dialects from the 1920s and 30s. And older people and, in those. And old people period. in those. So yeah. these were people who were mostly born in like the 1850s or 60s. Yeah. So you're dealing with an accent that's more than a century old, not influenced by radio and television because mm-hmm. they really didn't have it then. So this is a more pure form. Mm-hmm. And so I was able to use some of those clips to try to, to show how a Yorkshire accent or this mm. particular Yorkshire accent really sounded a mm-hmm. century ago mm-hmm. as opposed to today where it might be a little more variable. Yeah. And you get that too in Southern England with the, the classic example of Somerset accent yes. with yeah, the right. S becoming Z, Somerset. And, mm, and, yeah. and, <laughs> and so again, listening to accent samples I got, no, I couldn't find any that did <laughs> right, that. Right, because that must be a, yeah. a fairly heavily yeah. stigmatized So uh, I, accent, I, I, I literally had to go back, even mm-hmm. though it's considered sort of one of those standard regional accents, I had to go back in the archives to find a good sample of someone really speaking that way. Yeah. It was an old farmer um, and yeah, who did that, that repeatedly. He had F, I think his, his F's pronounced as V's mm-hmm. and S's as Z's. And, you know, that's classic Somerset, mm-hmm. but... I just had a tough time finding it. You know, you have to really look for it sometimes today. Yeah. Yeah. And especially, you know, your self, your audience is self-selected. They're people who listen to podcasts. Mm -hmm. So that's going to skew urban Mm -hmm. and skew younger Mm -hmm. and skew. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, You're not exactly right. Mm -hmm. The the people who tend to pronounce, have those old accents are not around. Or Uh, they're not listening to your podcast. (laughs) Right. They're not, when I say not around, I mean, they're Mm -hmm. living, but they're not listening necessarily Mm -hmm. to what I'm doing. However, I have had, listeners say my grandmother right. has a great accent and they've actually gotten oh, a grandfather yeah. or a neighbor yeah. or someone mm-hmm. leave the accent yeah. because they say i speak you know, i don't really have a unique accent but this person i know does no that's good yeah because that's sort of where you need yeah. to go for that kind of stuff mm-hmm. i'm gonna but ask before you we end. <laughs> i'm gonna ask you an absurd question that has no answer okay. <laughs> <laughs> what do you think the earliest english word is hmm you're right. It doesn't have an answer. <laughs> well, you see, now that's, I'm going to attempt to address this because the question is, at what point did English become English? Because mm-hmm. uh, as, as we know, English mm-hmm. evolved from an older Proto-Germanic language. It's so there is, no, process. Yeah. there is no oldest English word in that sense. Now you can find what is the oldest recorded, mm-hmm. documented English word. And I actually mentioned, well, I think there's some, that may have changed a little bit since I did, because my research initially, I think I've since seen some different arguments about that. And I, I'm trying to think back, because we're going back about four years in my research now, but it was an, an inscription mm-hmm. on an artifact that was found in Anglo-Saxon England. Yeah. And I can't remember if it was a reference to a helmet or what exactly it was. Now, I can't remember off the top of my head. That was that Rahan? Would that be Rahan? Yeah, we're, we're cheating because he's he's thought about this quite a lot too. But <laughs> yeah, yeah, the word for row for deer, deer, yeah. deer. Yeah, okay. yeah, yeah. That may be it. So that's different from saying the oldest English word, mm-hmm. but it's mm-hmm. the oldest maybe recorded, recorded English yeah. word. But, but of course, uh, as you say, I mean, how do you make a an artificial boundary over a continuum? Obviously, yeah. it's kind of absurd. I mean, do you say it only becomes English once the speakers of that language come to that landmass? I suppose that's yeah. one one way to do it. And what you realize is that even though we think of English, the three periods of English, Old English, Middle mm-hmm. English, Modern English, it doesn't work that way mm-hmm. because it's a continuum. And I'm dealing with, if you look at early Middle English text from say, the mid-1100s, late-1100s, and compare those to late Middle English texts Mm -hmm. written in the 1400s, you know, Sir Thomas Mallory or somebody, completely different. The earlier ones look like Old English. Modern English readers would would have a tough time getting beyond a sentence in it without being completely lost. The later period of Middle English, 
looks pretty close to modern English. Mm -hmm. So it's completely arbitrary. We use, I think, we, we distinguish Old and Middle English in part for based on a political uh, event, mm -hmm. the conquest of England by the Normans. That gives us a, a clear dividing line that we can start to make there, but the language didn't change overnight. Yeah, and, and, and in, we, we have a dividing line in the recorded language because we have, as you say, there's this gap where they sort of stop yeah. writing in English. Yeah. So when it reappears, it, you can tell there's a difference yeah. because you didn't see the in-between, yeah. so it's sort of easy. But the Middle English is much harder. You have yeah. to just sort of go with vowel shift, I guess, well, <laughs> to, to modern, I if mean. If you're going from middle to yeah. modern, again, completely arbitrary. Yeah. Because I think there's no gap. Like I think that. they would say, "Well, the great vowel shift is the big, mm -hmm. the the event, mm -hmm. the event <laughs> that caused the transition." Well, once you realize the event took place over two or three centuries, <laughs> that's not and, much at of a different event. time yeah, in different, different places. places. And, yeah. Yeah. So it's yeah. again, it's an arbitrary distinction. Mm -hmm. I think of it just in my own mind. The big event between middle and modern English was the printing press, right. and it's not yeah. maybe the way linguists would look at it. They would say great vowel shift. But to me, it's it's a more it's a, if you want to try to like the Norman Conquest distinguishing mm -hmm. old and middle. If you think of the printing press distinguishing middle and modern, it makes some sense because that's about the time the transition occurred. With the printing press, you start to see the real standardization mm -hmm. of mm -hmm. English, mm -hmm. with you know William Caxton and others saying, "Well, we're going to use this London East Midlands dialect because it's in the middle of England. People in the north can't really understand the people in the far south, so we're going to pick this sort of in between dialect. It's what London's now the capital, and that's where most people live. So this will become standard English thanks to the printing press, and then you start to see English really." becoming what we have today, something that's becoming more standardized, even though there was still and still is tremendous regional variation. So I, I think of that as maybe if we're going to pinpoint something that changed middle into modern, yeah. that may be it. Yeah, I think that's what linguists would say, too, is that, yeah, the great vowel shift it occurs over too long a span. To, to be a good marker. It's still going on when you're, when you're talking about something that is certainly modern English. Yeah. So um, I think linguists would say the printing press and the chancery standard mm -hmm. would be the uh, that's yeah. the key yeah. the key yeah. but it's still a bit arbitrary oh yeah of, it's still just a way it just yeah. allows you to you know we like periodization in history yeah. mm -hmm. we like it in other things because it allows you to and and it's certainly true that something from you know two centuries after the printing press is very clearly distinct from something two centuries before right. it so you know mm -hmm. something changed in between mm -hmm. but yeah. it's yeah at any moment mm -hmm. yeah like That's subdividing. Yeah. A not very good answer to a <laughs> no, no, complicated it, question. It's a question then. The, the fun of the question is the question. Yeah. yeah and answering it is sort of. Not, thinking about the possible. I mean, one could, What are the criteria? Yeah. What are the. Yeah. I mean, one, one could say that the word English is the earliest English word because Tacitus mentions the tribe of the, the Angles. But so, it's not in the form English. It's, it's not in the, the form, form Angli, 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 you know, but, but yeah. Well, it's also interesting to realize but not in England yet. <laughs> that what we call Old English is also known as Anglo-Saxon. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, it's called Anglo-Saxon in part to distinguish it from Old Saxon, yeah. mm -hmm. which was spoken on the other side of the channel. Well, these were, this, for the most part, the same people. Mm -hmm. They just migrated across the channel. Uh, the Angles may have had a slightly different dialect and, and settled in a different part of Britain. But, yeah, I mean... we. We're dealing with what is basically the same language, but there just becomes a split. Mm -hmm. There's no TV or radio back then. So once they lost contact, their children and grandchildren started to speak a little mm -hmm. bit differently. Mm -hmm. So, but it's, you know, old Saxon is it, still, I guess, recorded or partially reconstructed. Mm -hmm. And uh, you can see it's very much the same as, as old English. And what's even more fascinating is the realization that Beowulf, the most famous text from old English, <laughs> wasn't discovered by English scholars. Yeah. First of all, it's not even set in England. It's no. set yeah. in Scandinavia. Yeah. Discovered by a Dutch scholar yeah. looking for Dutch texts. For a nationalist and, project. Yeah, mean, and comes make. across yeah. this text, which he, I think, at first thought was maybe Dutch until he realized that it was Old English. And then you start to realize Old English wasn't that far away mm -hmm. from you know, the, the old Saxon, some of the northern dialects mm -hmm. that ultimately became Dutch. Uh, it's very similar language. In fact, when I've you had, look at Frisian, yeah, right, yeah, Frisian, that's the classic example still yeah, today exactly. is almost the same as English. So again, we get back into this idea that we think of these as distinct languages today, but they, they if you reverse engineer the languages, they all blend together at yeah. some point. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs>
Well, thank you so much. Um, this has been really fascinating, and we could keep talking, but fortunately, we can if we want. We're just going to cut out <laughs> the yeah. Off we're just going right. to cut out the audience. Sorry, audience. <laughs> but thank you so much for um, chatting. It's been fabulous. Yes, thank you. Thank you for having me. <laughs> of course. And we'll say goodbye. For more information on this podcast, check out our website, www.alliterative.net, where you can find links to the videos, blog posts, sources, and credits, and all our contact info. And please check out our Patreon, where you can pledge to support this show and our video project. You can go directly to the videos at youtube.com slash alliterative. Our email is on the website, but the easiest way to get in touch with us is Twitter. I'm at Avensara, A-V-E-N-S-A-R-A-H. And I'm at alliterative. To keep up with the podcast, subscribe on your favorite podcast app or to the feed on the website. And if you've enjoyed it, consider leaving us a review on Apple Podcasts or wherever you listen. It helps us a lot. We'll be back soon with more musings about the connections around us. Thanks for listening. Bye.